at the end of the day, when we talk about corruption, what we're really talking about is the corrosive influence of corporations and government working together at the expense of their constituents. That's like the like at the end of the day, right? I mean, like wherever we draw the line, there we're talking about the the antagonisms between these interests. Hello, can you hear me? Howdy. Good evening. That was a interesting last uh, spell you had on your stream there. I just yeah. turned it off so that I won't be uh, seeing any of the comments and hearing any feedback. But that's uh, wise. Uh, nothing but the best for my audience, conversationally, and and hence here you are. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll have to apologize a little bit in advance because um, aside from my prepared comments, I wrote down most of my big spiels here. Um, I'm just not really that talented at public debate and speaking, so I hope you'll forgive me a little bit for you know stumbling or tripping over my words. Yeah, I think we got the reflexive antagonism out of the way in the last third of the previous conversation. So I, I say I'm here for it. Great, thank you. So, uh, thanks for having me on your program. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. I've spent some time on your Discord over the last two weeks or so, and have had productive conversations with several of its members. I think that despite differences that people have in policy, generally everyone's aim is to reach the best result for the people of this country and the world, and that we just have different ideas of how to reach that. I think that everyone's opinion should be listened to and considered because we can gain valuable ideas from their input and their experiences, which helps us create better policy. Ultimately, I operate pragmatically and believe in discussing everything in good faith. That's why I'm here today talking with you, who I would generally consider to be on the other side of the economic spectrum. Yeah, I'd say so, probably. And also, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I'm what today would be considered a moderate Republican, although 10 years ago I'd have been considered quite conservative. Of course, aside from the needle shifting, my views have also developed since that time too. I do work in local and state level politics aimed at reversing the negative economic trends in my state. I also do a little national level stuff too, but my influence there is limited. And the only real thing I've tried is pushing legislation that punishes predatory scalping of computer components and game consoles. Oh my, well, okay, hold on. Hold on. I think maybe, maybe we can uh, right off the bat agree to something good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I think we'll find more to agree about than to disagree ultimately. While it may not be for most bombastic stream that you've had, uh, I think it'll be uh, quite enjoyable. My audience will survive. And uh, anything that involves uh, preventing video game and PC part scalping, I think, is, uh, uh, you know, just just a, a borderline axiomatic good. So, um, yeah, we'll live. Fuck those people. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll also let you know ahead of time, I'm not big on semantic argument, so if I feel something is coming to that, I'll probably submit on it and wish to move on, as I think that the overall policy ideas are more important. Um, the topics I'd like to discuss with you are tax policy, economic slash business policy, and lobbying. Um, tax policy will be more brief and obviously a bit more mundane. Uh, economic slash business policy is a big topic and probably the biggest reason I wanted to come onto your program. Uh, I'd like to hit lobbying last, but of the other two, which would you like to discuss first? Oh, I have no preference. I'm happy to debate all three. Or discuss. Cool. Um, I guess we'll just start tax policy, get it off uh, nice and slow. Uh, there's a few specific examples I'd like to talk about, though. Um, part of operating pragmatically is that I generally consider policy as it pertains to what we can actually accomplish from a given position. While it would be ideal to like snap our fingers and dictate the tax policy of every local and state government in America, the reality is that we have to work within the systems we can affect while respecting the effects that the existing systems of surrounding areas will have. Like if you just raise taxes to 100%, the people and companies will move out and then your system collapses. But that's obviously an extreme example. Does, does that make sense? Yes, of course. You have to take into awesome. account the consequences, you know, if we could snap our fingers, I wouldn't bother with tax policy at all. We'd be in communism, and that seems a bit unhelpful. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Taxes taken in by state and local governments are generally made up by three taxes, largely. 
income taxes, both personal and corporate, sales taxes, and property taxes. Which of these three do you believe should be making up a majority or plurality of tax receipts in a state or local tax system if the aim is to provide for a growing economy and to most benefit the average working class and poor resident, or to put it in a tax way, the lowest quintiles? Well, I don't know the relative proportions right now, and I imagine it would vary quite a bit per state. Um, I know that I favor sales tax the least of those three, because sales tax is um, uh, uh, regressive in, in, its, in its effect, um, and would disproportionately affect the poor, because a disproportionate amount of their income goes towards, um, you know, buying food or whatever. Um, in terms of where this all goes, I, I suppose I, I, I don't know exactly which I'd favor first, but I would prioritize income through property tax and through income tax uh, well before I would sales tax. I've seen some stuff on, like, I know sales tax uh, is, well, well, not an insignificant contributor to the state budget, you know. I feel like there's more work to be made up in the other ends. You know, you're 100% right. Uh, I generally believe that sales taxes are a necessary evil within a tax system and should be the most variable. They should be the tertiary part of the tax system. They should be the most flexible, raising and lowering based on the needs of the budget because sales taxes are extremely regressive. And the problem is that's a concept that that's largely misunderstood by local policymakers. Those people think that, you know, logically, since everyone buys stuff, everyone will pay the same amount of sales tax and that simple exemptions to things like food and medicine are enough to make it progressive. But as you stated, uh, studies show that the proportion of one's income paid in sales tax is highly tied to their income level, with the lowest incomes paying almost the actual rate of sales tax as part of their income, and higher income people ultimately paying many times lower than that due to their spending tendencies. Um, yeah, marginally so, yeah. Uh, uh, the vanishingly small amount. In terms of the income tax versus the... Um, property tax? I, I, I don't really know which is greater generally. Well, here here in Washington, we don't have a state tax, so I guess I know which is greater here. Um, I, 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 this is going to vary massively, like state to state. Um, I do feel like we need to massively restructure the way we look at property taxes right now. I know that a lot of, um, a lot of housing stuff is handled on a state and city level, so it seems also right that a majority of the taxes would come from, uh, you know, property taxes, which are managed at that level, as opposed to a state income tax, which is, you know, essentially just a lower cut of something that affects everyone federally, whatever job they have, you know? Right. Um, you know, property taxes, my belief is they should actually make up the lion's share of the budget. Um, the majority of property taxes, in my state at least, are paid by companies. Uh, I imagine it's probably true in most states. Property tax receipts are generally going to remain consistent year over year. And this is the important part. They have a beneficial effect on home values. Home values are driven down by increases in property tax as the cost ownership of any asset directly affects its value. Since the cost of ownership will increase, the value of the home will decline which more easily opens up home ownership to lower incomes since the biggest barrier to home ownership is the upfront cost involved. Something I'm doing with right now, I'm trying to save up, you know, a down payment for a house, uh, which of course that scales directly with the value of a property. I'd never actually thought of that. The idea, yeah, because essentially if you raise property taxes, what you're doing is you're cutting down the upfront cost for a more, more of a long-term, um, you know, for, for, for uh, portioning out that cost more long term. And it is the upfront thing that's mostly the problem. Because after all, if it was just the monthly payments people took issue with, I mean, people rent, you know, like a, a mortgage and a rent. I, the rent's usually going to cost more for the same property because you're covering the mortgage of the landowner. Oh, I, I didn't even think of that outcome. Yeah, I think 100% uh, property taxes every year. Um, that's, my, that's my new policy position, I'd say, as a governor. Awesome. Um, and I'll just hit income tax real briefly here since, uh, you know, regarding personal income tax, I think we can briefly agree that a very progressive system of personal income tax is the only logical way of using it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has awesome. to be. Awesome. Uh, I think that they should be secondary to property taxes. 
Uh, personal income taxes have a very strong effect on individuals' choice of where to live. And because lower income people have much less mobility in that regard, higher rates of personal income tax will, over time, more negatively affect lower income people as the higher income ones relocate outside of a locality to avoid taxes. Aside from the government not receiving you know, its income and their income and their property taxes, these people will be less likely to frequent the shops, the restaurants, the auto repair stores, or the local establishments within the original locale, which hurts the prosperity of the working class people of that area. There's a happy medium dependent on the area and the surrounding areas where income taxes of a certain level raise tax receipts without driving away enough higher income individuals to cause such a drop. What do you think about that? No, I think that's perfectly agreeable, yeah. Uh, the, the, right, the right to go find something better is something usually reserved for people with the capital to do so. Um, otherwise, you're stuck with what you're stuck with. Um, you know, with regards to like um, I income tax, you know, relative to, to property taxes and stuff like that, it does feel like there's more flexibility as well with what housing situation you want to live in, you know? People can live with like family members, especially if you're poor, like that's one of the backup options, right? You live with friends, you live with roommates, uh, you live with uh, your parents, and that's a way of, of I think, sort of um, flexibly adjusting the relationship that you have with whatever the housing market in your area is, which of course would be affected by the property taxes, but income taxes, not so much. I mean, you work the job you work, right? Most poor people don't have that choice, um, or at least not much choice when it comes to that or, or, or to move states and get a lower income tax. So yeah, I think I agree with everything you've said so far. Great. Well, uh, that's our brief uh, discussion on tax policy then. If, if we're pretty much in agreement there. And I, I figured we would generally find most areas of agreement on that. Um, so I guess we'll move on to business and economic policy. Um, I expect both of us to learn a lot on this conversation. Uh, uh, this is, I, I imagine this is actually so. developing. Yeah, I don't Go normally ahead. get in the weeds on stuff like this on my stream. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm stanced up. I'm ready uh, to, to talk about <laughs> real issues instead of what people said on Twitter. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've watched a bunch of your streams the last couple of weeks. And the philosophy stuff, you know, that, that kind of flies over my head a little bit because it's not an area I'm well-versed in. I'm certainly learning a lot uh, watching it, even, even though, obviously, necessarily, there's a lot of things I disagree about. Um, but I, I'm hoping that a policy discussion still interests uh, your audience. I think it will. Awesome. So, for economic and business policy, I think that we need to look closely at the relationship between business management practices and business education with the growing wealth and income inequality issue in this country. Income inequality is something like tripled in the last 40 years and wealth inequality is also you know, doubled or something. I don't have the exact numbers here in front of me, sorry. Uh, but that problem causes a lot more issues than the obvious one. And that is the obvious one is working class people being underpaid. Healthy economies rely on those inequality rates to be as low as possible. The reason for that is twofold. One, it enables higher rates of social mobility, allowing more people with good ideas to become successful and therefore implement those good ideas, leading to a higher quality of life for everyone, thus society improves. Secondly, the lower quintiles directly spend a higher proportion of their income, putting that money back into the economy and growing it. Higher growth in the economy again, raises the standard of living across the board more quickly. I'll explain on how business policy is the driver of these things, but first, do you agree with those ideas on wealth and income inequality? I do. Cool. All right, so here's where business policy ties in and where I think that your ideas on uh, worker ownership and participation in uh, company management are particularly useful in policymaking. Are you familiar with the business management concept Shareholder value. I am. Awesome. For those in your audience that are not familiar, it's where the management of a business is centered completely around raising the stock price of a company as much as possible to create high financial returns for investors. It was popularized as the premier business management strategy, largely because of Jack Welch's management of GE. It existed before that, but Jack Welch made it very popular. It cut costs gutted supposed inefficiencies and strategically used his company's money for the sole purpose of raising the stock price. 
With those ideas, of course, the stock price rose, which made the investors and day traders very happy. And those people then pushed to have his ideas integrated into business schools across the country as the right way to run a company. With business schools teaching shareholder value, current and next generation of managers and executives operate centered around its ideas. Shareholder value isn't even a flawed concept, it's an unmitigated disaster in terms of its effects on companies, its effects on employees, and its effect on the economy as a whole. The effect on employees is probably the best understood one. You know, most companies now actively work to minimize employee pay and benefits, maximize their workloads and responsibilities, uh, you know, leading to a stark increase in income and wealth inequality and a lower quality of life for those workers. Executives get rewarded by investors for this behavior with large bonuses, often based on a percentage of how much they've raised the value of a stock. So, you know, aside from their business education they're now receiving, those executives are also financially incentivized, excuse me, to engage in such predatory behavior. The effect on companies is also deleterious. I'd like to explain this with an example. Are you familiar with how Boeing operated as a company up until it acquired McDonnell Douglas around the turn of the millennium? Anecdotally, but not severely, no. Cool. Boeing operated in a way that I think you may be a bit happier with in terms of how a company should be run. Is, is that, you know, matched kind of what you thought anecdotally? Yeah, I, uh, I had a, uh, there was a friend of my grandfather who worked there around that time and for a long time before and after. Um, so I heard some stuff like that. I never looked into it, though. Gotcha. So. Boeing executives and managers were generally all promoted internally from entry level positions, mostly the engineers. Because of that, they cared for their average employees who enjoyed great work schedules and high pay and benefits. And also, if my memory serves me, those employees were given ownership as part of their compensation. The employees, and especially the engineers, had huge influence on not only Boeing products, the airplanes, but on how the company itself was run. Because of that, the employees tended to stay with Boeing their entire careers, and as they grew in ability, experience, and familiarity with Boeing products, those products became highly successful. If everyone that's designing and building something has been doing so for a long time, the consistency of staying in that position has a strong synergetic effect with the outcome. Boeing was highly successful under this paradigm of lead with the employees, and they will lead you to success. You think that if we were to stay under a capitalist system, that this type of company governance and operation is most beneficial to the working class? Hmm. Well, Boeing's system is definitely preferable. It seems like the attitude that a lot of these companies have with the maximization of shareholder value um, incurs a different set of priorities. It's one of the big reasons that corporations will promote their CEOs from outside uh, and their higher management as well, uh, because they're looking for, lo I, I, I feel like they're looking for loyalty first and foremost, you know. If you have an engineer who works at Boeing, um, and they've worked there for 25 years and they're dedicated and good, you know, you could promote them to management. And I think that's a good thing to do, but there's a logic there that in doing so, you're really only promoting them out of their best place. And that the best kind of manager you could get is some kind of, you know, generic middle manager who, who's, who, you know, being brought in essentially as a, a permanent consultant, you know. Uh, the, with their only real concern being their ability to answer to higher management. And I feel like that sort of um, shiftless management category where people are constantly jumping between jobs, you know, CEOs will spend two years here and four years there and everywhere. I feel like these these ideas make sense if your goal is to maximize shareholder uh, value, but obviously that doesn't pan out well for everyone. I get the shareholder value thing because it's a very strong empirical measurement. Stock price is literally charted on a graph. It's very easy to figure out. It's basically like a number telling you how popular a company is and how good it's doing relative to other times in its existence. And I understand that empiricism is attractive. And obviously the shareholders want to make more money. There's no getting around that. But the shiftlessness, uh, th the set of priorities that make line go up, I don't think they build a um a very strong uh corporation in in terms of like internal loyalty 
uh, in terms of discipline and in terms of like a relationship to your workplace, or to use a Marxian term, the degree of alienation uh, that you experience. You know, I think that nowadays people feel much more detached from their workplaces than they did maybe you know seventy years ago. Back when unions were stronger and people might work at a factory for like 35 years consecutively, you know, when management was promoted internally, it felt like there was a bit more of a, you know, an internal community. And I think Boeing hit on that maybe a, a little bit later than a lot of other comparable companies. It's still capitalism, mind you. There are still problems with the structure, but I definitely think that's preferable to what a lot of other companies have done. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head here, Bosch. Boeing, good to know. <laughs> you know, it, and this is what I'm talking about with ways that we can interact and figure out good ideas. Because we could both sit here and say, you know, this is a problem for the left. This is a problem for the right. It's not a problem for either side. It's a problem for the people in this country. When these companies move from management styles that reward everyone that works for them into ones that don't. And, you know, that just contributes to the income and wealth inequality problem, which you might not think off the top of your head that conservatives and Republicans uh, see the wealth and income inequality as a bad thing. But, you know, I was originally introduced to this concept from a dude who's 70, almost 71 years old now, who, you know, served in uh in politics for a long time as a republican and i was i was kind of shocked at first i was like you know this was probably four or five years ago i said how is how is it that this this capitalism you know this wealth and income inequality you know how's that a bad thing and then i started doing my research and that's led me to where i am today uh now i'm kind of going on a soliloquy i apologize about that oh, i'll admit i'm i'm perplexed by the association there's no denying that, you know, advocacy against income inequality is definitely overwhelmingly associated with the left politically. Um, I, I know that there, there's kind of a paradigm shift with some groups, you know, like blue dog Democrats who were relatively reactionary but cared about their unions, used to vote blue, but now they mostly vote red. And there were a lot of people who voted for Trump because they thought that he would bring, you know, manufacturing back in the Rust Belt. So I know there, I know there is like, there is a wedge, there is like an element of the group where income inequality is a severe concern and then you vote Republican. And I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit, I think that there are at times tenuous connections there, but, um, if, if, if people care about, you know, the same shared outcome, I'm happy to, to, to work with them on that as long as it's not to the, to the, to the, you know, the exclusion of other values. Right. Right. And I'll, I'll briefly mention, since you said other values, uh, because I, th I think a lot of people may not recognize this, but when it comes to many social issues that are you know, part of the Republican Party, quote unquote, platform, uh, stuff like LGBT rights, um, and then some other ones I can't think of off the top of my head because I'm live on air, but uh, there are a lot of them. It's if I'm going to be frank, it's all boomer shit. The folks that are involved in politics that are my age, uh, you know, 20s and 30s, we, we're all on the same page here. Republican, Democrat, everyone deserves rights. Everyone deserves the same treatment. It's ridiculous that we're, we're trying to decide you know, government should decide what, you know, you have to be this gender or that gender. No, you can be any gender you want, and we're going to call you by whatever you prefer. It's all the old boomer bullshit that's keeping it from progressing. Uh, and I actually think you'll find that on both sides of the political spectrum. I think that there's, while it's not as common on the Democrat side, there's uh, certainly still some resistance from the old guard there as well. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on that. No, no, I, I get it. I mean, I do know there is a, a, a strong contingent of young Republicans who are all, you know, avid Ben Shapiro watchers, but 
I don't think they're the majority oh, at all. Lord. The numbers indicate they're a pretty small minority, I think, at least relative to previous generations. I, I, I will admit that, you know, out of curiosity, um, and, and we don't have to argue the point because I want to talk econ, but what, what, what draws you then? You know, what's the, what, what pulls you red instead of blue? Because I don't believe that we should be combating business. I don't believe that we should be working against uh, companies. You know, it's, it's largely from an economic point of view. Uh, I think that there, we can do a lot more by working together and by leading companies to create better outcomes for our communities rather than trying to, uh, you know, and this is, this is, you know, very hyperbolic, but punish them or, or, uh, you know, something to that effect. Uh, and it's, it's a harder, it's a harder question for me these days than it used to be. Right. But, the, the Democratic Party is continuing to go further left. It's, it's getting closer and closer to you than it is to me, uh, given a few more years. Inshallah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so I, I think that it'll be a little bit easier to answer the, that question at that point. But uh, it's also much easier for me to work within the Republican Party. Uh, and when you consider my point of view that everyone's goal is the same. We all want the best outcome for the people of this country and people of the world. Uh, that it doesn't really matter what card I'm carrying. Uh, I'm working to make things better. I'm not working to push an R or push a D. All right. I, uh, yeah, there's no need to split hairs over it. Not for this conversation, at least. I think, um, I, well, I'm interested then as we talk more about this, because I feel like the outcomes you're describing here, the things that we want changed, uh, are things that corporations will need to be pushed into doing, or, or I guess to to frame it in in the relation to fr to frame it in a way relative to the earlier conversation I had today. You know, the material interests of uh, you know shareholders w precludes them towards managerial strategies that might not even be to their benefit but certainly are not to the benefit of their workers. And that the best thing we can really do, honest to God, for them too, is to rein them in um, to affect positive outcomes. But I guess we'll talk about that. Yeah, you know, that's, that's actually the, the hardest part about uh, the solution that I was going to talk about. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and move on with the other half of this uh, little spiel here on the economic policy and shareholder value. Right. Um, I'll just finish off the Boeing thing. Uh, when Boeing purchased McDonnell Douglas, it was in 1997, they, for some ungodly reason, chose to adopt its business strategy, that is shareholder value. Boeing's track record since then has been poor. Uh, first, there was the 787, which was horribly delayed and over budget, which was completely out of character for Boeing. And then the 737 MAX situation which again was an issue because of overwork and timelines. Experienced and talented employees uh, left in droves. The employees were cut out of the process of managing Boeing and their products suffered huge setbacks as a result. I think that that company is one of the best examples of how companies that honor their employees, rewarding them highly for the value they produce, and including them in every step of the process, not only empowers the employees themselves, but leads to successful business. Uh, and in that way, I think the interests and ideas that you and your followers bring to the table are incredibly valued in creating an economy that's led by robust, successful companies and rewarded and valued workers. So our area of disagreement isn't so much in kind of the, the I guess you would say, material outcome that we're uh, getting here, but the motivation behind it. I want a growing economy with robust, successful companies and well-rewarded workers. I think that model is the best way to raise the quality of life 
for everyone living in this country. And ultimately, that's my goal. And I hope that's the goal of anyone that's in, that's in politics. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, I'll agree, certainly. I mean, long term, obviously, I have more aggressive economic designs uh, that I'd like to see implemented. But in terms of general principles, I think that's a good way to work with what we have. Um, I think in terms of implementation, there's there's a happy medium to the strategy that you need. But it seems like, um, well, there are just the the shareholder value model is predicated on a bunch of tenuous assumptions. Uh, for example, that a corporation with a high stock value is is doing well. That's generally an assumed thing. Uh, that things which increase the stock value of the company improve the company, you know, uh, and that um, the decision making t towards ends that raise the, you know, the, the, the price of the company, um, th that if that's done in a top down manner, you know, that's like an acceptable dictation. Essentially, you, r you rest on the assumption that the shareholders act in their economic best interests, you know, in a, in a sort of Randian sense. And as a product of that, you know, their, um, what do you call it, chivalrous, chivalrous greed uh, fuels the economy. It, it, it moves things forward. And I don't think that works for a few reasons. I mean, there are obvious technical ones like, uh, you know, workers have valuable insights into the functionality of companies that management can't really understand. So cutting workers out of that process means that you're going to have problems governing from the top. You have this problem. It's funny you bring uh, Boeing because this is like the history of the airline uh, industry, really bad top down decision making where you will have engineering disasters have billions put into them um and and, and you know like with, with multiple like just, just failure after failure you know and it's being done usually to fulfill a contract or because the um the announcement of the plane's existence to begin with you know the buzz that was generated it was good for the company it raised the, sh the shareholder value um i agree with all this uh my only contention is that I don't think it's really possible to address this issue without cutting back on the power the shareholders have uh, in terms of, you know, the direction the company goes. I think that their interests are not the company's interests. And it's ultimately the health of the company, both in terms of its uh, profits and its productive output that are beneficial for society and for the workers uh, who are employed there. I think that, that, um, that schism, that lack of an overlap uh, it causes a bunch of problems that could be fixed with additional worker control. And here's where it gets interesting. Regarding things we can use to fix the issue of shareholder values grip on our business policy, I think it comes as a mix of two things, education and incentivization. So we need to push back on the support of shareholder value in business schooling, replacing it with, you know, sort of the more traditional business education that existed prior and it valued employees' contributions to the process of creating quality products and services, and that their retainment synergizes efforts over time, leading to highly efficient business. Now, the other side of the coin that I got about, uh, got the idea about when talking to your folks on Discord, one of them presented the idea of using government to influence companies into worker ownership. You know, obviously, that's not a Republican idea. <laughs> but given the previous examples, we see that companies that choose to do this on their own are the best companies. Boeing rose to the top. They beat out McDonnell Douglas. They beat out, um, what was, who made the, I don't want to get in the weeds about it. Uh, so I thought about what things that the government can do from a Republican point of view that would encourage companies to move into this good direction. And the solution I came up with, with was what I call incentivization. Government can empower companies by providing tax incentives to reward employees with stock compensation, uh, aka ownership in the company. For example, if a company includes an additional 10% of an employee's compensation as stock, that 10% could be tax deductible from the company to some degree. Taking away the idea of percentages for clear reasons, we could instead target it as up to $5,000 or maybe $10,000 paid to an employee annually as stock 
can be tax deductible, again, to a certain degree. And plus, wording it in such a way would prevent abuse of the system by just you know, giving the executive like 10 million in stock or something ridiculous. In this way, we can promote the good business practices and also help to solve that issue that you stated about the stock owners having different motivations than the workers. If the workers turn into a sizable group of stock owners in the company, then suddenly that problem gets a lot smaller. And that's doable because a lot of these companies, you know, if we're disregarding Tesla and Apple, whose you know, stocks are way overinflated, a lot of these companies have you know, revenues that are and expenditures that are not really that much smaller than their stock price. And oftentimes, they, they can be bigger. Uh, so it, the employee compensation as stock would actually begin to make up a sizable portion uh, enough to matter in these decisions uh, over time. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I'm down with the concept of incentivization, though obviously the severity of the incentivization is going to vary. I mean, technically, do something or we'll arrest you is an incentive. Um, uh, oh, a, yeah. a, a harsh one, yeah, uh, admittedly, one that'll make people angry. I guess a few concerns are, I don't think there is any real pressure in in Washington or, or at a state level, really, to, to push for these... Um, these, these reforms that would allow for greater worker control or that would incentivize greater worker control. Because I don't really think, well, again, to use our term, people are very class conscious. I don't think it's something people are very aware of or something people fight for. Um, and I don't think it's something that the shareholders want either. Uh, of course, if the company was ever restructured in such a way as to allow the workers real control, the first thing that would go would be the shareholders. Um, I, that's sort of the tipping point, right? As a matter of self-preservation, they can never allow too much worker control. You know, Boeing was run better at that time than a lot mm -hmm. of comparable Keep alternatives, it. but no worries. It was run better, sure, but it wasn't worker ownership. At the end of the day, it was just the mantra that taking better care of your workers means you have a better company. And that's a sensible, you know, business strategy for as long as it works and for as long as people pretend to care. Um, but in, in, in terms of a substantive shift in, in, in the power, uh, I don't think minor incentivizations will suffice, especially since, you know, the government can offer as many tax incentives as they want, but it will never come close to the amount of money that shareholders stand to lose if they ever lost the ability to, uh, you know, well, maintain their positions, uh, to, to, to control these companies, you know, through, through the majority share, uh, through the board that they were elected to. It would be um, trivially, trivially easy for a company with sufficient worker control to just essentially oust them. And at that point, I mean, no tax incentive will ever make up for that. Unless you want to, you know, pay everyone like 10 million a year to just sit at home and twiddle their thumbs. I, I think it ultimately it's a power grab. And that power grab needs to be facilitated through some strong arming um, because the incentives just won't cut it. See, here's an area where I think we disagree on. Because, for one, this is actually a, a policy idea phrased in the way I presented it. Uh, that is, uh, employee compensation as stock being tax deductible uh, is a policy idea that actually may be palatable to uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress. This may actually, this could actually have a chance of being utilized. It's just a matter of raising awareness about the issue of uh, shareholder values, deleterious effect on business, mm -hmm. raising awareness of that issue to the point where there is enough uh, motivation to get this through, to get something done to help fix the problem. And because all of, I shouldn't say all of these politicians, because the politicians I've talked to recognize that Income inequality and wealth inequality is a bad thing, no matter what card they're carrying. I think that with sufficient education about this, that we could actually make this happen. It's, Not in the next five years, but it's something we could do down the line 
And in this way, the the workers they they they'll they'll own enough of the company so that their word matters. But you know, ultimately, the stock price and the the stock ownership is going to be mostly traded on the open market. It's it's up to the workers whether they want to maintain that stock or sell it. Uh, and I'm I'm not entirely sure where you were going with the shareholders not being happy about the workers owning a certain percentage of the company and doing something to prevent that. I'm not really sure why that motivation would be in place, but in my mind, the moment the workers owned a sufficient part of the company, they're simply getting uh, you know, s sufficient compensation. They're staying at their jobs, they're working harder, and their company then dominates the market. It's a strong business strategy. It's not something that the shareholders, the other, the outside shareholders would necessarily be against. And of course, the workers that own that part of the stock as well do want to see their stock price go up. They do want to see their retirements essentially uh, grow in value. Uh, you know, as, as those workers age out, they're going to sell that stock and, uh, you know, as, as a portion of their retirement. So, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's as combative of a situation as I, as I believe, and I, I, I don't want to put your words in your mouth, this was just my interpretation of what you said. Uh, I don't think it's as combative of a situation between the existing shareholders and the workers because the end result is a strong business. Well, keep in mind that stock ownership as part of a workers' compensation package doesn't actually give them any meaningful control over the company. There are companies that do this, but it doesn't allow you to, bless you, it doesn't allow you to... Oh, it's my dog. <laughs> oh, well, bless them, I suppose. It, it doesn't allow you to make any decisions about how the company is run. It's essentially just an incentive attached to your pay, the same way they attach it to a CEO's pay. The better the company does, the more money you get. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose that's nice, but I, I don't really think that necessarily confers control. With regards to the, you know, the likelihood of business owners acting in the best interest of their own business, I, I think, I, I mean, I guess I don't really know how much they care. They seem to care about their own well-being. Um, but as we were talking about the shiftlessness of these things, with CEOs yeah. and shareholders sort of cycling in and out as people buy and sell, you know, looking to pump up a company's value, get in when you can, get out when you need to. Um, that's not the case with all companies, mind you. I'm not saying that every shareholder's board has been there for like eight minutes, you know. But um, there, there definitely isn't a perfect overlap between the interests of the business and the shareholders, nor the interests of the business and the interests of the workers. Um, we need we need more than this for proper uh, for proper worker control. Uh, and if they were ever to get enough control, uh, the working uh, people of any given company, you know, the first thing they would do, I imagine, to save money would be to uh, get rid of the shareholders. Because worker control is inimicable to standard shareholder control, you know, with the board of directors. I apologize and all for that. interrupting, but mm -hmm. you'll have to elaborate on me by what you mean by get rid of the shareholders. Because uh, oh. at that point, they're the shareholders. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Well, the share, the board, the, the shareholders control the company because they own it. They literally buy it out. But it's not a properly democratic model. If it was just a collection of workers who bought it out, then they would just become the new shareholders. The disillusion of the system, which allows for that kind of ownership, is necessary for real worker control. Which is why worker co-ops aren't listed on the Nasdaq, right? I mean, I mean, there's some variants here. There are different like types of, you know, sometimes companies will list like a portion, a non-controlling portion of their company, um, and people right. can, you know, invest over that. And I don't necessarily have a problem with shares being used as a means of investment, non-controlling shares, where you're just essentially betting on the company's well-being, but you're not capable of controlling it. But the traditional shareholder model, where you have both ownership and control, can't work in tandem with worker control. So it, it, it seems like outside of, um, you know, internal pressures like unionization, 
uh, the only you you can't, you have to go one direction or the other. And right now, since the power stick is in the hand of the shareholders, I don't know why they'd ever let that happen. It seems like <laughs> very much not in their interest. Ah, the reason it would be in their interest, the reason it'd be in the business management interest, is because of that tax deduction idea. So, say you've got company A and company B, baseline salary of 50000 offered for the same position doing the same work. And company A chooses to engage with that tax incentive, so their total compensation is actually 60000 but they're paying the same amount of tax. Well, no, no, they're paying less tax, excuse me. They're having the same amount of expense paying 60000 as the other company is paying 50000 because that extra 10000 is deducted from their taxes. So it is in their best interest in order to get the best employees to include that compensation. You see what I'm saying there? But not control. Oh, what control could you offer through that? If you're talking about a tax incentive for a kind of limited democratization of the workplace, I, I think that's nice. But, you know, real worker control um, is going to entail something more. I, there's no tax incentive you could offer, you know, the, the, the board of directors to leave the position, right? To, to dissolve their ownership. Um, not unless there was some kind of force involved, you know, like the government just cracking down on that. Well, see, the, here's the thing where it gets interesting, because obviously these things are not monolithic. Companies are not monolithic. Even boards are not monolithic most of the time. Uh, and shareholders as a whole are not. And shareholders elect the members of the board, obviously. Uh, so if it's in, in a manager's best interest, to include the compensation because it costs the company nothing and it gets them a better chance at getting a better employee, they're going to do that. They're going to include the stock compensation that is tax deductible, the ownership compensation to the employee. So that individual motivation works. Well, so to, that to provide what? Just to be specific, just so I know fully, what's the tax incentive for? Oh, sure. Sorry, I, I mentioned it earlier, but um, we, may, we may have glossed over it. Saying up to $5,000 or maybe $10,000 uh, that is paid to an employee in stock ownership, I guess controlling stock, if you want to be specific, can be tax deductible. That is, if you pay an employee stock compensation as part of their compensation package, that the money that is, or excuse me, the amount that is paid in stock is deducted from the amount of taxes that is owed to the government by the company itself. That's really just a subsidy though, isn't it? I mean, at that point, you might as well just have a UBI where the government just gives everyone, like, like I understand the, the incentive structure for getting better employees, but in this case, we're not really taking anything from the company, you know, we're just, we're, the government is just, giving them that much extra, you know? Right. I mean, and you can, you can, you know, raise rates to, to, to a level where you are receiving the same amount of in, uh, income from the economy overall. But uh, this is why we have incentives all over the place. And this is why we have rates that where we, you know, nominally we have a 10% rate and we actually collect one and a half. But that aside, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really simple way to get, the motivations of the various parties involved on the course towards creating better business governance, creating a model where the employees of the company own a sufficient portion of the company so that they can help guide it in the right direction. But how would they? I mean, unless, as, as a group, I mean, even if you were to issue 51% collectively to all the workers, they would essentially just be two competing shareholder boards, right? To, to a cent, or they would just elect kind of a representative. I don't think it meaningfully challenges the issue with capital acquisition. This is just kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's essentially just sort of a government subsidized bonus package, right? I, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, the fact that we're talking about subsidies sort of undercuts the truth. The fact that, you know, um, the, it's very difficult to get the shareholders to do what we want. Because otherwise, you know, we would just be talking about things they should do, right? 
I mean, if they're if they have right. a proclivity towards good business business management, they would do it. So we're talking about you know, oh, the government will give them this or that, you know, tax subsidies. But I don't think shareholders are gonna do anything uh, at all without being forced to. If you look for the history of labor, like this is the case every time, right? I mean, all the way back to the feudal days to now, every time there was an update, OSHA, fire codes, you know, emergency escape ladders, hours, no child labor, no slavery, every time. It's never like uh, the government incentivized it or, you know, uh, there was a tax incentive or whatever. It was do it or we'll put you in jail or sometimes we'll shoot you. And that just seems to be the, the thing that drives all of these positive changes. And, 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 I, I, and I'm not trying to, to, to overrun or anything, but when we talk about stuff like subsidies, I'm all in favor of incentives, you know? I, I think that can go a long way. But past a point, you know, um, we're, we're really just kind of, like, giving our scraps to, to an institution that is already quite powerful which will be only made more powerful, by the way, with uh, tax subsidy, subsidies given uh, for, for offering, you know, um, shares their employees. We have to get to the heart of the problem, which is the very existence of that divide between worker and owner. Well, you know, that's, that would be obviously an area we disagree on. Uh, I believe that the best way to raise the quality of life for everyone in this country is to grow the economy via uh, minimizing wealth inequality, uh, but wealth inequality will still exist. Minimizing income inequality, but income inequality will still exist. Uh, because ultimately, the incentivization of doing well for yourself does lead to innovation. We just can't let that incentivization uh, get out of control to the point where a CEO is making 5,000 times that of uh, what an entry-level salaried employee is. Uh, well, why wouldn't it, though? I mean, that seems to be working okay for that's them. Our <laughs> well, <laughs> that's I, well, our I job. Well, I agree. To, but to there's, influence them to not do that. But Well, there's no, no incentive the government can afford will outpace the billions they make. I mean, you know, somebody like Jeff Bezos, like what incentive does he need? You know, he, he'll get more money ignoring the, the incentives than he could ever get by, by, by kowtowing to them. I think sometimes well, Jeff you, Bezos you is to, an asshole. He, that is true, but <laughs> there are many little Jeff Bezoses, right? And we're not appealing to better nature here, you know. Shareholders will and have done monstrous things if it increases the evaluation of their companies. We Very think, yeah, we think domestically, but like all one has to do is look at a trip uh, of industrial accidents abroad to find American companies, you know, working through the deaths of thousands of Indians or Pakistani or Chinese workers because they cut safety regulations to make, you know, that much more money per unit sold. Um, we we uh, with this we need the stick. The last time income inequality was this bad, we needed a new deal to sort it out, right? I mean, sometimes incentives, uh, they only go so far. And this, this kind of brings us back to what I said about, I kind of operate pragmatically here. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I can get legislation through Congress that uh, where we're hitting companies with a big stick and telling them to give ownership to workers. But I do think that an incentivization structure via subsidy where we target this as viewing it as a way to do better business, as a way to make better companies. The companies will make more money. The employees will make more money. The country will grow richer. Society will improve. This is the end goal of this system where we get the employees back involved in the process. They're not going to own the majority of the company. Most of these employees are honestly probably going to sell their stock. That's just the way things go. But it is going to put us on a path away because the things that set us on these paths are so minor. Jack Welch is a footnote in history. The people that started shareholder value as a concept, we don't even know their names. Well, I don't know their names. I'm sure the internet does. But we, these little things like these subsidies can cause such a chain reaction of individual motivations because these groups are not monolithic. These shareholders are not monolithic. Each manager, those, that single manager that decides to implement this subsidy 
when hiring their next worker because it gives them an advantage over the next guy trying to hire him. It's that simple. I then that worker gets ownership in the company. I don't, I mean, again, it, it, look, it, this isn't to say I necessarily think this would be bad for workers or anything. I just don't see how it's any different from the government just directly cutting. Like, why not just have the government directly provide a tax incentive to all workers? Like, why even go through the company, right? Because the, the, the government, the corporation is not giving up any money or power. The power relations are completely unaffected by this. What we're really talking about is, yeah, is, is, is essentially just a, a, a government a tax incentive. But the, the power relations, you know, that's what need to be addressed. If we want to deal with income inequality, you can't do that without... Because you look over the past hundred years, you know, corporate power has risen dramatically. Unions are down, um, you know... Uh, we, we've had a massive deregulatory boom since Reagan, you know, uh, Nixon created the EPA and it took all of like 25 years before it got axed and then cut in half again and again. It, it, corporate power has grown markedly. So I don't think talking about cutting corporate power should be treated as unrealistic. I agree that we can't just put forward some congressional proposal to make all businesses worker co-ops or whatever, but I think that there is... We do concede something when the conversation is limited to measures which do nothing to address the power imbalance and instead just kind of, you know, um, t touch at the edges, you know, benefit a company by giving them higher quality workers uh, because they have more bargaining power because they have that tax incentive to levy um, at the government's expense and the workers get a bit more money. The government could do it directly to the workers, but then the corporation wouldn't get the reflexive benefit. It would just be a direct wealth transfer, which I'm in favor of, mind, but, you know. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really trying to instill this, the idea back of companies like Boeing. That's why I brought Boeing up initially as, as my prime example here, where because this employee's you know, had ownership because the employees were valued. That company succeeded and their workers stayed with them the whole time. Boeing dominated the airline market and, you know, then they adopted shareholder value and everything went down the tank. So we've got clear examples where if the companies do this, then they treat the workers a lot better. Those workers are much happier. Those workers are much better compensated. So while I don't think that, you know, worker ownership of the means of production, if I'm to be meany here, uh, is necessarily the right path, I do think that worker involvement in the means of production uh, is not an idea that's reserved for the left, nor is it an idea that necessarily needs... Oh, come on, doggy. You want to go out? Uh, nor an, an idea that necessarily needs to be done with direct government legislation telling someone to do something, but providing a small incentive to push them in that direction will simply be enough. I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little bit there. That was definitely not a fully thought out idea. Uh, no, no, not at all. Forgive me. No, no, it's no, it's fine. It's just there is it's uh, it's a kind of capitalist realism, I think, where the, the range of potential solutions to our problems, is it's limited very fiercely. Um, with regards to this, I, I don't know if it, would, if it would incentivize that change. There's a reason why these corporations have moved over to the current model, the more exploitative one, and it just, it seems to work for them better. I mean, in terms of them acting in their own interest, maybe the corporations do worse, but they're wealthier than ever. We can see that because the income inequality is so high. If the corporations do poorly, I mean, they have their golden parachutes, they can loot it. You know, the, 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 uh, the FEC uh, historically has been, you know, uh, done fuck all, I think, to, um, to, to, to prevent this, this stuff from happening. And it, it, the, the, the income inequality is a testament to the fact that what they're doing from their perspective is working right now, you know. I don't think anything can change that except for some measure that directly addresses it you know um severe taxation 
Uh, I, I, at this point, I don't think the corporate level biz, like stuff is going to work that well vis-a-vis um, -vis incentive structures because I feel like right now corporations are so bleedingly efficient. It's difficult to, to inject any incentive that would cause them to do things differently that would be superior to the accrued benefits from doing things the way they are right now. And there are a lot of things you can't incentivize, right? Like promoting from within. I guess you could, uh, you know, government will subsidize pay to a, you know, to a, to a manager if they've worked at that place 20 years. Uh, you could find a way, some means tested thing, but like, why should we have to? Why should, why should my tax dollars go to bribing companies into doing things that are better when my tax dollars could go to police putting them in jail? Right? I mean, like, I, like potentially, well, we could strike at the stick. problem here. Huh? Carrot or the stick. Yeah. When you hit them with a stick, they're going to find a way to dodge it. I, I mean, historically, they carrot, have They're definitely going to come. The regulations have crippled them in the past. And by cripple, I mean sure. not their sure. industry, but it's, it's, you know, it's put them in line. But the carrots, right now, no carrot we can provide will pull them out of what they're doing. It's very efficient for them, these, uh, this, this current model. I think we, we, we need to be very, we need to be aggressive and we need to normalize that anti-corporate language, you know. I don't think that's mutually exclusive to a sensible perspective on economics or like a reasonable um, reformist approach, you know. What can you realistically pass through Congress? Well, I understand right now I'm not saying anything you could fit into a bill. I know that. Um, I mean, not a, not a bill that'll pass at least, but I, you know, because I, I haven't sat down and sort of thought of ways to chart out like a a, a a a policy path. But I think that's the road that we need to be on because I mean, I just worry that eventually, you know, government control is going to be so scarce and corporate control is going to be so significant that you know, the government is essentially just an instrument to use tax dollars to try to cajole corporations into doing slightly less destructive stuff than they would otherwise. I, like the is it carbon, carbon credits? Or, or, did those yeah. work or did those not work? Um, I, there was something that worked and something that didn't if work. I recall, if I recall the idea of carbon credits uh, mainly just ended up making places like bakeries uh, go out of business because just by the nature of the work, industry that they were involved in, they had to use a lot more. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly not an expert on that. But carbon taxes, hey, you emit, you know, you emit uh, uh, pollution, uh, you know, here's the solution. You smack them with the tax hammer. I mean, that's fun. And then we have more money to uh, bribe corporations into providing stock options to their workers, I guess. I, I apologize. I understand I'm not speaking directly of policy. We've 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 moved some, somewhat from that. I have significantly oh, le fun. less faith than you do in the likelihood that the carrot is is capable of derailing like the multi-trillion dollar modern American industrial machine. I feel like it's a very big train. I feel like we need more than a penny. You know, we need to like lay a couple of cars on the tracks. <laughs> Well, if you've ever seen the videos, I think cars laying on the tracks uh, may not do a whole lot either. But uh, that's uh, true. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's kind of a thought experiment because you know we've seen the trend of growing income and wealth inequality going on in the last two decades. It was probably started to being uh, recognized as a problem by uh, mainstream uh, politicians and uh, news outlets probably around the year 2000. That's when they started seeing the trend and going like, hey guys, something's wrong here. Uh, and we've kind of figured out since then that directly taxing to fix the problem hasn't really worked. We haven't figured it out. The problem's only gotten worse. So that's why trying to come up with a novel idea of incentivization incentivization is hard to say that word a whole bunch of times in a row yes for sure um, as a different approach may be more effective by addressing the individual motivation um but i think we're going a little bit around and around on this point um 
uh, and I also think that we've reached a good understanding of it. Uh, so if you'd like to move on to lobbying, uh, since we've, I guess, spent almost 45 minutes on this one, uh, <laughs> we, we can go ahead and move on. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's hit up lobbying. I, we, we have shared values. I think that's, I think that's important. Um, but yeah, um, hit me up. All right, so lobbying. <laughs> it's uh, pretty spicy. Mm -hmm. Oh God. I actually don't expect to get along on this, but I at least hope that I can help you and your viewers understand a little bit more about how the system works and the protections that are in place to prevent abuse. And when I say lobbying, I'm mostly talking about on the federal level at this point. I think there's, there's state lobbying, uh, of course, but um, well, the local most well lobbying happens on federal. But local lobbying is basically just mob bullying, right? I mean, if you're the mayor of some <laughs> 20,000 population town and there's like one, you know, one factory or whatever, you know, they just, they just send a guy to your, your mayor's office and go like, hey, it would be a shame if all these jobs disappeared, huh? You know, it's a little more explicit at the local level, I think. Well, I'm, pl I'm playing, I'm perhaps. playing a bit, only a little bit, but a, a, a bit. Um, but yes, continue. Uh, it's actually important that we are talking about federal since uh, a few of the protections in place are specifically federal. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, let's get a couple things out of the way. The most basic misconception of lobbying is that uh, is people pay politicians to do or support certain things. And let me be clear, and you probably already know this, the majority of your viewers probably already know this, but some of them may not. So it is against the law for a congressperson to accept any form of payment, gift, service, event tickets, etc., in return for political favors. Any payment that a congressperson receives before, during, or after their time in office is so heavily scrutinized by the opposing party that things falling through the cracks is very difficult. Both parties wish for nothing more than even a shred of proof that the other one is corrupt due to the damage that would do to their opponents. A congressperson with evidence of corruption is virtually guaranteed to be replaced by a member of the opposite party in the next election. I hope that's somewhat logical, unless, you know, one believes the entire system is some elaborate dog and pony show, then that may not work. But I hope for the rest of us, that's, that's somewhat logical, right? We, we, we might believe it's somewhat of a dog and pony show, but no, I, I don't think it's generally done through, through that. I think that'd be a very, it's a very stupid way of, of using corporate power to influence politicians. I think generally, I've used the term lobbying in a kind of catch-all term before. It does have a technical definition. I think when I've used it, I'm, I'm applying it in a couple of ways. Do you mind? Do you mind if I say just just to go for it? Go for yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm I'm generally talking about the the practice of using material incentives to to incentivize politicians to do X, Y, or Z. Um, I, I think I mean the big ways this happens. Obviously, you have super PACs, and you know corporations, uh, you know, they can't donate that much to a person or, well, you can't donate at all to a person for political favors. Um, but you can, you can toss quite a bit either directly or indirectly to, um, to, to campaigns or to adjacent causes. Of course, uh, there are also politicians who are swayed from perceived material benefit. Like for example, senators and congressmen, uh, uh, have a definite favorability towards uh bills that might disproportionately affect um you know something like for example like this is a classic one right like uh you know uh an arms manufacturer uh 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 wants to you know gets in on a contract and you know they're going to set up a factory in in new hampshire and all the new hampshire congressmen and senators are like oh yeah oh we yeah we want this because they know it'll create like thirty thousand jobs or whatever um that well, kind that's of thing. a perfectly appropriate motivation for their, you know, they're, they're just representing the people of their district. But I think the people of their district would be quite happy for that. Oh, sure. Uh, but, but, but keep in know, mind, that's, that's the same with the guy who asks the mayor if it sure would be a shame whether or not they lost all their jobs, you know? That's always how the incentives work, right? I mean, it, the line between properly representing your constituents and doing corporate you know, uh, do, acting in the interests of corporations in ways that align with the interests of your constituents is kind of a fuzzy one. But technically, it's broad enough that you could include like a lot of really bad stuff, right? I mean, you you could you could there you could act corrupt in line with those principles if if you wanted to. You know, like New York City mayors, um, 
who would like overlook certain businesses paying their taxes or like their health and codes or whatever, because if it's shut down, they'd have to look into 40 other places. And, you know, then a whole neighborhood goes mm -hmm. out of business, like that kind of stuff, you know? So I, I don't, right. I don't think it's like a, a problem with illegal behavior so much as it is a fundamental consequence of the relationship between power and capital. Um, no, I actually touched exactly on what you just said at the end in, in different words, but, um, I would like to talk quickly about how lobbying, act, the actual, you know, lobbying as an industry functions. Uh, lobbyists are paid by organizations, whether they be companies, governments, unions, NGOs, etc. And then those lobbyists contact politicians and express the interests of whatever organization they represent. That's done very openly. So why is it that a congressperson would answer their phone to someone if we're operating on the assumption that what I said earlier about, you know, uh, illegal payments, gifts, et cetera, is true. Like, in what circumstances do you answer your phone? Do you answer to random numbers? Do you answer to friends and family? No. Right? Oh, yeah, I answer, answer, to, to, I answer to no one. Uh, but yeah, well, yeah, I, I expect politicians to, to work closely with corporations. It seems like a logical extension of the system we live in, right? I mean, corporations are literally the economic arm of our country. Like, there's very direct shared interest between these groups in terms of getting things to work right. No, 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 no. They will not just answer the phone to the company. No, no, no. So, you'll answer your phone to your friends and family, right? Not just random numbers. Yes, sometimes. Right. So, Congress people work the exact same way. The reason that they're answering their phone to lobbyists is it's because it's someone they already know. The secret is most lobbyists are longtime members of the political process. These are retired Congress people, retired congressional chiefs of staff, etc. They've worked with the people in office for decades and know them very closely. Because of that, their perspective on issues is highly valued by those politicians with whom they cooperated the most with while they were in office. So. Let's draw a comparison. I promise I don't mean to be patronizing. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think this will help illustrate the concept. If you're to listen to two people give you advice on what concert to go to, one person being your best friend, the other person being a total stranger, which one would you probably listen to? Probably the former. Right, obviously. That's, that's the reality of lobby. Politicians' friends get paid to express the interests of organizations who would otherwise be unable to get heard by those politicians. Now, a congressperson isn't stupid, gen generally. Uh, they know that their friend is being paid to express those opinions. Nor are the lobbyists stupid, so they're not trying to hide it. It's not so much of, here's what I think as your best friend, lies, but here's what you know GM thinks about this legislation and why, and here's what I think about that. Because of that, lobbyists just generally don't take clients whose stances on policy they don't agree with already. Because they can't fool their friends, the people they worked with for decades, about what they support. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Now, what you said earlier, the sad, unavoidable reality remains that it costs an absolute shit ton of money to hire a lobbyist at all. So only rich and powerful organizations or people can play the game. That's the actual really sad part about lobbying. There's not it's not corruption. It's not, uh, you know, all these people being paid behind closed doors or what have you. It's just that only the rich can do it because there's not that many people who are former Congress people or former congressional staff members who can actually perform this job. And so as just a simple supply and demand, it costs a lot to pay them. Uh, that's just, that's the sad part about lobbying. Uh, Anyways, I hope that little detailed information helps some of these people understand it more. The, the regulations and protections in place are incredibly powerful, and the industry just boils down to friends talking to each other. You know, I imagine not a lot of people, especially not a lot of your viewers, are very open to accepting that, so I completely understand if uh, you all choose to disregard it. Do you have well, any further takes on the specifics of the lobbying industry? Well, the issue is that when you talk about corruption, you're delineating a legal distinction, um, not so much a moral one, you know. There are plenty of other countries that are, at least by my definition, more corrupt than ours, where they 
can get away with doing things that are illegal here. And there are countries that are less corrupt than ours where they can't do things that here in America you can do. And they would call what we have corruption. At the end of the day, when we talk about corruption, what we're really talking about is the corrosive influence of corporations and government working together at the expense of their constituents. That's like the, like, at the end of the day, right? I mean, like, wherever we draw the line there, we're talking about the, the antagonisms between these interests and the degree to which it's been legislated. And, I mean, obviously, given a socialist perspective, my issue is that there's a distinction here at all. Uh, my problem with lobbying has nothing really to do with the way in which they do it, because you don't really need to lobby to be corrupt. In fact, no money ever really has to change hands in order for, you know, corruption to take place. Um, the very existence of an incentive structure and groups that can act on it to the exclusion of others is sufficient to uh, outrage me morally. I mean, for example, like corporations, they're the economic wing of this country and they're not democratic. They do not answer to the people outside of, you know, you, you can vote with your wallet, but like, okay, sure. Vote Amazon out, whatever, you know? Um, <laughs> now let's, let's take Amazon. Amazon is a necessary component of American economic activity. If you Thanos snapped Amazon out of existence right now, it would be devastating. I mean, it'd be devastating all over the, you know, a good deal of the world, but here in America, especially, it would be very bad. And the fact that that's the case means that they have an undemocratic power they can levy uh, when asking politicians to do things in their favor. We saw this when Amazon tried to set up a factory in New York, but it goes way beyond like individual factory and plant locations, right? If, if you know, uh, here's an example, uh, uh, corporate tax rates, right? Uh, Ireland has famously low corporate tax rates as a way of incentivizing foreign investment. You know, set up your corporations here. Great. America, maybe America, all the people in America and all the politicians, you know, maybe we want a higher corporate tax rate, which is dumb because corporate tax rates aren't very helpful. I'm more of an income tax guy, but let's just use this for the example, you know, but they know sure. that there will be capital flight if that happens, hypothetically. Uh, the corporations would leave. They, they, they don't want to pay the taxes. They go to another company uh, or another country so they don't have to pay the higher um, corporate tax. Th that pressure right there is sufficient. The, the um, economic consequences of acting against the corporate will could, could very well mean that there, a, a company experiences devastating consequences for not, you know, essentially bending to their interest. This, this acts out in so many ways, locally and federally. It's not really about the lobbying directly as it is the fact that our politicians either have to or do anyway uh, kowtow to the will of corporations when it's not to the benefit of Americans. I think one of the worst examples of this was back when... Um, they made it so the IRS doesn't just send you a tax bill every year. Um, you know, cause, cause other countries, like they'll just send you a tax bill. The IRS will just be like, Hey, pay this amount here in America. We have to file our own taxes, even though the IRS knows what we owe. And that's just because, uh, tax filing companies wanted to make it that way. They were like, Hey, we'd get a lot more, uh, we'd get a lot more business if hundreds of millions of people had to pour over their receipts for, you know, hours. Hmm for for weeks you know so just, so they just made life worse like objectively basically um because it was in the interest of that group now there was nothing illegal there i mean that's fine I mean, that just sucks those companies suck I right mean, but that's I my big concern there and they they wouldn't <laughs> have even needed to say anything right there's so many interplays here uh you know you have you have politicians who will continuously you know vote in favor of increases to the military budget and then they go act as a consultant for raytheon when they're done you know you have people who go into the lobbying industry who act as avatars for the corporations that they defended the interests of when they were politicians you have people like trump who go from being a billionaire corporate you know uh owner to being a politician and refusing to divest his corporations or his ownership over the companies and 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 then you know like maintaining friendly relationships with countries where he has hotels it's stuff like that right like the the corrosive influence here it's not just lobbying it's the fact that there is this separate economic block the bourgeois who have so much control over 
the future of this country and no democratic accountability. I understand I've just gone on the whole socialist rant again, but I, I yeah, that's <laughs> that's my that's my thing with lobbying. It's a fundamental relationship. Uh, they could add a bunch of lobbying regulations. It wouldn't change the fundamental relationship. It would just make everything a little more subtle, you know. Yeah. Um I just hope you get my perspective. Because, I know you won't agree with it, yeah, but like no, I hope totally. you get yeah, okay. Um uh, there was a lot to go over there. Uh, <laughs> the first one was regarding what I consider corruption. Uh, I don't consider it just from a legal standpoint. Um, my idea of corruption is that anybody who's elected to an office has an obligation to do what's in the best interest of their constituents. So if they are acting in a way that they believe is not in the best interest of their constituents, that falls under the realm of, of corruption because there must be some other motivation behind it. But they can be mistaken in their beliefs. You know, you've been wrong about things before. I've been wrong about things before. People in Congress are no different. They can be, uh, there was virtually every person in Congress was wrong about the Iraq war. And the vast majority of those who voted for it have, uh, come out either publicly or privately and said that they regret that decision and that it was a mistake. Uh, but they believed at the time that they were voting in the best interests of their constituents. Uh, so I don't think that those people are corrupt because they made a wrong decision. I think it would be corrupt if they made that decision knowing that it would be uh, against the interests of the people that they represent. Well. I'll I'll will ask you, okay. Um Go for it. It, it, so so we're not drawing legal parallels here, mm -hmm. but you know, um morally speaking, right? Um let's say you have a monarchy. You have a you have a king and you have a great many subjects and you have, you know, a royal house with a few dozen aristocrats, lords who control, you know, large territories from a castle with their serfs and blah blah blah, you know, the whole nine yards. And All right, we're playing EU four. We're playing EU4, right. No incest this time, though. We're getting right to the point. And, um, you, know, let, you know, maybe you have it so that... Um, maybe, maybe you have it so that the... Um, the uh, uh, you know, there's a war effort going on. The king needs more money in taxes, okay? Um, and it is for the, the benefit of the realm uh, that this be done. I mean, you know, don't want an invasion, Okay. But he also knows that raising taxes would incur disfavor from a couple of the noble houses, and that the noble houses, acting on their disfavor, might go back on some relatively progressive uh, local taxation rates and um, uh, tariffs that they've, uh, not tariffs, um, doles that they've taken, uh, to the point that raising taxes globally might lead to, uh, you know, disastrous uh humanitarian problems in some regions of his uh of his kingdom and this is like a real thing that would happen right you know uh being no, a king it's totally realistic oh yeah yeah constantly about balancing like all the noblemen were like mentally ill inbred incestuous <laughs> fuckwits right and they, you know they're they're all like you know they're obsessed with like their next boar hunting trip and uh, anytime they had to pay money they would go and like rape a cow or something i don't know they're in uh, fuck being a king but anyway like <laughs> the, 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 the categorical problem is that sometimes acting in the best interest of your constituents means kowtowing to forces I don't think the state should have to kowtow to. Now, of course, a monarch isn't democratically accountable, so I'm really only playing this up for the, for the sort of amusing comparison. But, you know, mm -hmm. if, if, a, if a corporation uh, is, you know, too big to fail, as the banks were, and they're struggling... Uh, we have this weird situation where you're acting in the interests of your constituencies by bailing them out, which was what Obama did. And I agree with what Obama did. You know, the banks have paid back their loans. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not one of those lefties who bitches about that. We, we, we um, paid the, you know, we, we bailed them out, but we never fixed the problem, really, with the banks being too powerful, um, which means that we're in this weird situation where we're willing to do these giant wealth transfers for the benefit of the banks to support our constituency, but then we're not willing to make substantive changes to pay it down over the line, to keep it from happening again. You know, 
sometimes this is it's really kind of a hostage situation, right? You know, uh, like we're acting at our own best interest when we give the bandit our our, our money. Like, or sorry, I'm 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 going all over the place. I apologize. Quick, simple, clean example: the International Monetary Fund. Okay, uh, the international, oh yeah, the International Monetary Fund, uh, is generally in favor of getting developing company or developing countries to adopt economic reforms, which makes them amenable to Western business investment. And in these situations, often the leaders of these countries have to give massive provisions to corporate investment, low taxes, low corporate taxes, low, I mean, low everything, you know, the government will subsidize all this crap, the government will build your roads, it'll do everything for you, please, God, corporations come invest, you know, and it is technically for the betterment of the country that they do this. Because if they don't, everything falls apart, but it's not a choice they should have to make. You know what I mean? So See, that, that actually brings up an interesting point. So if you're the leader of a uh, sub-Saharan African country that uh, wants IMF loans, and they are requesting that you open up your country to business um, uh, for the West, and the two projections are, projection one, you do not do what the IMF wants you to do. Your people continue you know, having a standard of living that is uh, quite below the standards of uh, the rest of the world generally. Or option two, assuming that, you know, you're not some horribly corrupt dictator and will quander all of the IMF loans and not actually get anything done, uh, the projections say that your country will, uh, you know, reach the level of... Um, you know, Egypt or, or South Africa or one, one of the other more developed uh, African countries. Uh, and your people will generally have a higher standard of living across the board. Now, I understand that that second scenario perhaps doesn't play into the leftist ideology. You know, it makes them further away from communism or socialism or, or whatever term you'd like to use. But would you consider that to be a corruption mechanic where the leader chooses the IMF loans? Yes. Oh, I'd say it's coercive by, by necessity. Um, well, coercive, yes. I, I, well, I think it, that's a very broad term. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, certainly it is. I think, I mean, I chafe at the existence of the choice at all, I suppose. There are countries yeah. that have, you know, eschewed the IMF and done a sort of, you know, um, uh, very like, um, what's the term? When you're very economically nationalist? Protectionist. Um, gotcha. Right, when, when they engage in, you know, protectionist policies and really build up their economy internally. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes taking the IMF deal is actually the better one for a country, in which case, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's kind of like being an orphan on the street and a guy takes you in, but he only lets you sleep in the dog shed and he feeds you like, you know, meat scraps. I mean, it's technically an improvement over being on the street. You have a roof over you and you're getting some food, but it, you know, the, the guy is a house right there. He could let you into. Um, and I guess that's the issue ultimately, you know, they the the IMF lets countries develop in so far as they remain useful to Western business investment. That's the critical element there. Not the country developing, but you know, as long as their laws are amenable, you know, their natural resources are accessible and cheap for uh, Western extraction, then that's the main thing. And if the country gets rich off that, fine. But they can't ever get that rich because you don't get to be a United States by following the, do you know, the dogma of the IMF, right? You know, the United States isn't wealthy because, you, you know, we're amenable to foreign trade and we sell off our natural resources for cheap. We're, we're, we're the United States because we're, you know, the, the, the zenith of industrial production, of, of, of innovation, of business acumen. I mean, we're the United goddamn States. You can't just play second fiddle to another country forever. And I guess I feel that way about the corporations too. 
the corporations, you know, businessmen will ask of politicians, this, that, the other. Politicians can do it, and maybe it's for the betterment of everyone, but it's an unfair deal because things could be so much better if we didn't shake hands, but instead, you know, uh, uh, crushed their hands in our, in our mighty grip and then robbed them blind. Um, Ouch. Which would be... Which would, which would be nice. You know, metaphorically, nobody needs to be, nobody needs to be hurt. If the corporations were, were wealthier than they are now, I mean, hell, look at, look at, uh, like, uh, India, uh, uh, after Britain left, right? I mean, you have all these Western corporations that are scurrying around, trying to find purchase, you know, whatever they can make use of. And, um, the, the right answer overwhelmingly and in many cases was to let them do what they wanted because they would bring in money. But like, God, what a fucked choice, right? I mean, there has to be a better answer. And I think the answer in many of these cases is that there shouldn't be an ultra powerful corporation bossing you around like that. That just, the, the, it's the, the answer is to remove the question to begin with. I, I understand, I understand what you're saying. Um, and that, that kind of brings, brings me back to the difference between idealism and pragmatism, right? I, oh, yeah. I'm, I may be mistaken, but I believe that you've uh, called yourself quite a pra pragmatic person generally. Am I incorrect? No, you're correct. Though I think we're finding this is a relative term uh, in the political spectrum. <laughs> perhaps. Uh, perhaps. But... Clearly, you understand that making these choices that are for the best interests of the constituents may not always be uh, objectively, you know, right from, objectively morally correct from the point of view of a certain system of belief. Uh, but it's still the right thing to do because the most people benefit from it. Yeah. I mean, you can do the math on this, right? Like, um, if you have, uh, if you have, um, if you have, uh, um, how do you put it? A small town that's not doing well economically, and a company offers to invest to build a plant there, you know? But you know that, like, this company has uh, a lot of emissions, and there tend to be health problems, and they've had, like, three scandals about, like, you know, chemicals being dumped in the water you know well, what's, oh, that's, what's... that's horrible that's the, you, you can't i don't think you should compare dollars and economic value to what's i mean that, that's that's not even really a determinable amount of harm that could be done to that community that i uh, i think it any happens. reasonable politician sure some of them choose the money but i think well, the, the jobs really well educated politician should definitely not be choosing to endanger their constituents' health. I, I think that's completely irresponsible. 1, 000, I don't think you'll find me disagreeing on that. 1,000, 2,000 jobs in a small community where people don't have money to buy groceries outside their, uh, their, their food stamps? It happens. And they, they make those decisions, you know? And all the time you find out after these, uh, you know, after these big ecological problems, they found, you know, mercury in the river or poison in the ground, flint water, whatever, you can usually trace it back to somebody making one of those choices, right? Some, one of those, you know, uh, we don't have the money for this, you know, we're not going to spend the money on this, we need the jobs, overlook it, you know, de delay the safety inspection, put it down the line, they make these choices all the time. And, 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 you know, and sometimes there's a big blow up scandal and, and people go to jail over it. And sometimes there's nothing to even be said because it never comes out or nothing illegal actually took place. And sometimes the harm isn't that explicit, you know, chemicals in the water is pretty upfront, but there are other things yeah. too, uh, like unethical industries, for example, you know, uh, it, you might have an issue with, um, arms manufacturers. Um, or, or anything related to the military industrial complex, you might have an issue with a particular company, uh, like car companies, right? Like maybe there are dealerships that want to open, but these companies, they, you know, they, they, they morally object, but you don't get that choice because it's, it's not a fair deal. You know, we need companies, but they're accountable to nothing outside of stringent regulations and, um, well, I guess they have to be profitable. Not even. I mean, as we see with, with the subsidies yeah. and the banks getting bailed out. I mean, they don't even have to be that anymore. 
Every um, ride share company in existence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can run billions in losses and just and and I and I I understand this oh, is Lord. like a a pragmatic um thought on my part, you know. Uh, but every once in a while, life uh life reminds us that there is a better way. You know, I'm reminded of uh, a Mister um uh, a Mister Fidel, you know, back back during the oh. Batista regime in Cuba fascist you know real real piece of shit uh, and and don't get me wrong castro made a ton of mistakes definitely better than batista though and um anyway I, I think there was this there was this company that was actually funneling money to castro because they were an american company and they saw the writing on the wall batista was going to go down and they thought hey castro might be the next you know cuban leader we should get in good with this guy. We'll pay him now, and he'll be favorable to us when he takes power. And Fidel took that money, and when Fidel ran his revolution and took charge, he just nationalized the fucking corporation anyway. Yoink! Just fucking just took just took it and ran. And and uh, I, just dumb decision on their part, on the company's part. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, they 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 might have thought he was just another crony, but the guy actually yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I Castro, I'm not a huge fan of. It. I I recently discovered in some research mm -hmm. i say discovered that's a really poor way of learning of saying it but uh, i learned via some research that he actually pinned a letter to khrushchev during the cuban missile crisis asking khrushchev to just go ahead and use the news in basically in the world <laughs> uh, like, yeah he had a he had the, a joke the guy's, the guy's fucking nuts and terrible sorry if you if you like him but i I, I can't, I can't take that, that he actually did that and then consider him to be a redeemable person. I hope because it goes us. against, it goes against my, my whole thing of, I'm trying to find the best good for the most people in the world. And this guy's over here trying to end the world. No, I get that. <laughs> I, I, l listen, we've all, we've all almost started the diplomatic process of ending the world in nuclear hellfire. Okay. This happened to all of us. <laughs> you know, we've all had our moments. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a testament to the guy or anything like that. Broadly. I'm only saying that, you know, history has shown us that things are incremental until very suddenly they're not, you know, um, that, yeah. you know, right. You get long periods of fairly minor changes, but every once in a while there's a flashpoint. And my hope is that increasing antagonism against the wealthy today can, can provide us the political will for a flashpoint. Because I've given up hope that anything less than a flashpoint can make a real difference. Like, you can get some reforms, and they're good, don't get me wrong, you know. I think some of the stuff Biden has done, like the cutting the, the child tax credit and, um, you know, the propositions for the infrastructural bill, I mean... It's not enough, but it's better than not having it, even if I mean, whatever actually ends up going through. Um, yeah. But the real root of these changes, you know, it just it just seems to be that corporate element. The, the fact that, you know, we, we had our enlightenment and we figured, you know, hey, it's good when governments are democratic. And then for some reason, we didn't extend that to the corporations. We just thought, yeah, you know just let the entire economic wing of the world, all productive capacity and output, essentially the bedrock of all modern civilization. We won't make that democratic, you know. We'll make the governments democratic, uh, but not most governments in the West will not have any direct control over those, you know, forces of production. So we've kind of a tenuous, it's like we're riding one of those bucking bronco robots at the bars with the, the, the chicks with the cowboy hats, you know? The mechanical bull. Yeah, 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 the mechanical bull. We could just turn it off. Now, sure, the, the restaurant staff might try to stop us. Uh, we just have to fight them. And, uh, and, and then we can turn the bull off. I'm sorry. That was a fun, that was a, nah, just fun, fun image. Just someone trying to run up and turn off a mechanical bull. Yeah, like decking, like, staff, like, like, two hooters like waitresses at the same time while charging the the bull with like a wrench you know uh yeah I, I'm, I'm just it's it's a glib subject right i mean I, I i because my 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 greatest belief and i would love to believe this is that all of these negative forces in the world can be changed and improved at least somewhat with 
mechanisms that work within the law, within the acceptable purview of what can be done. But if you look through history, that's just not how things go, right? I mean, it's always like there's some factory strike and 20 people died or like some politician gets assassinated. Here there's a revolution, there there's that. And then big things happen. You know, we needed a whole civil rights act just to get, well, I mean, the whole civil rights movement to get the civil rights act passed. Um, and that didn't even have reparations attached. That was just the basic shit, you know, uh, desegregation. Um, and, and, and people thought that was impossible before too. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. A lot of it is just normalizing the belief that we can go further than what electoralism can do. That electoralism is like, a just one of a number of, of means of political expression. And as long as those means exist, I appreciate what you do. And I agree with you on almost every normative issue, where we should go. And I think people, because this is not coming from the left, by the way, people need to have a good sense of economics because that's not coming from the left, not the online left at least. Um, but there also needs to be that push for something beyond or outside of, I think. See, and that I think is where we may disagree because I, I, I don't believe that this incrementalist approach leads, we're not slowly tipping over the boulder until it reaches the edge of the cliff. That's not my belief. My belief is that I'm trying to push this boulder away from the cliff uh, down a gentle slope that leads to a bright field of roses. I don't know. But uh, I, I like the system we've got, uh, obviously. I wouldn't be a Republican otherwise. But I think that if everyone were to do better, that would, that'd be the best, and that I think this system is the best way to do that. That's where you and I disagree. However, because we agree on the same uh, things that should be done, that is decreasing income inequality, decreasing wealth inequality, valuing uh, the average employees, uh, the lower quintiles, and making it so that they have a higher quality of life, then why can't we work together? That's why I'm here on the show. Because even though I'm a Republican, even though I'm a conservative, who is a, which is a group that ad admittedly you, you demean uh, about every two minutes, a, a uh, little bit, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a little bit. Let's not exaggerate. From time to time, I have my moments. Um, that I can, I can get ideas from you guys. And if you guys would like, you can get ideas from me. And we'll end up with better policy as a result. No, I don't that's, disagree that's at all. My, my, dream, um, my dream, I guess, lefty pushing for econ stuff would be a person who is, you know, like they're in like the state, you know, legislator and they're talking with state representatives about like the need to like slightly adjust like housing taxes or whatever, you know, and uh, um, the, you know, they're, they're talking with a group of people. There's some, you know, like stodgy, you know, Republican there. They're, what are you, a socialist, you know, because they want to raise taxes 4% yeah. or whatever. And, you know, the, 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 the young, uh, the, you know, the young um, staffer there sort of pushes their glasses up like the anime, you know, and the cinnamon says, no, and, and it gets on with their work. I think you, you, need to, you need to be able to do both. You need to be able to flawlessly um, work within a system and to maintain a, a rich distaste for that system. Because if you, if you only do one of those two things, in my opinion, I mean, at least if you're a socialist, right. um, if you only do one of those things, your, your ability is, is limited somewhat. Um, yeah, in terms of like optimism for for the the incremental progress that can be made, obviously we differ significantly. In terms of like the the big bold changes, I'll I'll just ask this: Is there a time period in American history um, that that you think was better than what we have now with regards to the economic situation, income inequality, workers, owners, that kind of thing? Not accounting for technological changes, you know. I, I don't. I don't mean like like obviously right now the economy is better than it was in the fifties. But if you could sort of normalize for that and just take into account the attitude, the 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 environment. If I'm to consider my primary metric as quality of life, standard of living, you know, kind of a mix of those two things, 
then I would actually I would not say that there's that there's a better time in America than right now. Uh, I think that we're leading down a path at which it will plateau for the average American, or it'll plateau for the average worker, uh, where their quality of life, their standard of living will not be improving anymore. Um, and that's the trend that I'm trying to reverse. Uh, but as it stands, I do think that generally every, every quintile, again, to use that term, has a better quality of life than they did at any point in America's past. I feel like a lot of that is because of technological changes, though. If you could normalize, you wouldn't for be wrong. That, there's almost no way to actually like do that, like normalize for that. Like that's that's very much like kind of a fantastical thing. A lot of our conceptions of the economy of the past are kind of romanticized too. Like the average mm -hmm. person in the 1950s didn't actually live in the suburb with the dad working a comfy factory job and then going home to his homemaker wife. Like the average. The average 1950s household had a dual income, you know, I, um, right. I, I, yeah, I, it's just, it's when, it's when upper middle class white families had to do dual income that everyone freaked out. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. I don't know. It's, it's, it's really difficult to say. I just think that, um, if, if you go back there, there are nice things to look at back from those days. And it just seems like a lot of them were a product of attitudes and regulations, which just don't exist anymore. At least pro union. I, are you, are you pro union? Like the idea, like workers should be able to organize their interests against, uh, uh, their, their, their boss. If you ask me the question, do I think that workers should be allowed to organize in their own interests against those of the company or their boss or, or whatever, uh, whether that should be legal or not, I think the answer is obviously yes. That, of course, should be legal. I, I think that unions have uh, historically been the source of a lot of uh, great advances in this country. Uh, I do think that there are situations in which unions overstep uh, what they should be doing. A lot of those are public sector unions, unfortunately, that manage to do that. I'm not um, a big fan of police unions, I'll admit. Police unions, they're a big one. They're a gigantic contributor to the culture of uh, not weeding out bad police officers. You know, I, I don't want to jump into that subject, but uh, I do think that police unions have a hand in that. Uh, and a lot of teachers' unions... Um, you know, they're, they're on strike in a bunch of cities right now uh, because they don't want to return to in-person learning. Now, a lot of those are very valid because they're in a lot of those areas, the rates of infection are uh, quite high. Uh, we're hitting records again in, in, in many of those areas. But yeah. even in some areas where it's not uh, as much of a pandemic right now, they're, some of them are striking. Uh, and it, it seems a little bit more self-serving than it does to be in the interest of the students and the teacher. Uh, now, I, I hope that makes sense. I, I, I know I went a little bit further beyond the purview of your question that was intended. No, I get it. It, it, it. I do think it interesting, though, the way we talk about unions, you know? Whenever it's, when it's, when it's with unions, you know, sometimes unions overstep, you know? What are your thoughts on unions? Oh, they have their good and their bad. Nobody talks about corporations that way, right? corporations are in infinitely more powerful than the unions. Unions aren't really an independent economic body. They're just kind of a internal regulatory mechanism, a way of, you know, uh, uh, forming a, a competing power group. Um, but whenever people talk, and not just you, I mean, but whenever people talk about unions, it's always this like, well, you know, they have their good and their bad. But when we talk about corporations, it's sometimes bad things happens because of corporations, but their existence is taken as a kind of, existential for granted like it's like it, it's just a like a point in reality you know what i mean and and the thing is right they might be right because corporations self-perpetuate because they have their own power they have their own uh you know mechanisms for enforcing political will but unions don't uh which is why in the united states even though it's illegal to fire people for unionizing uh it happens all the time and of course you can never really prove it i mean you know it's uh you know somebody talks about unionizing and then they get fired for 
uh, poor attendance because they missed one day. You, you can always get that. I mean, there's no way to stop that from happening. Um, and the right to work laws and everything. So right now, like it, it feels like unions are a dying flame and corporations are a forest fire that has eclipsed the entire, uh, you know, Pacific Northwest uh, in terms of like what needs to be protected. Do you get what I mean? I kind of understand that. Yeah, I, I will say, I will touch on this, even though it was only tangential to what you said, mm -hmm. mostly because um, what you said, I can't really find any disagreement with about just a objective. This this is the paradigm, um, but oh shoot! Oh yeah, right to work laws. I don't believe that somebody should be obligated to join a union in order to work at a company or in order to work in a position. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that that union still provides benefits to that person in terms of uh, working conditions, uh, pay, other forms of compensation, uh, et cetera. But, you know, we don't force people to vote, but they still benefit from the, from what the laws that politicians pass. I, I just don't agree with, with the obligation mechanism at play there. And while right to work laws encompass many, many, unless I'm mistaken, many other things besides just that one point, um, I do think in that way that they are uh, not mistaken. I think right to work laws refer to a few things, right? There is the compelled union participation. I think there's also something about um, whether or not non-union members have to work alongside unions in in in, contra in contractual negotiations there, there's something to that i think um it, i guess the thing that gets me a little bit is that there are so many rights that we're willing to leave to the market when we take political democracy to be sacrosanct you know there are things we think you shouldn't be able to sell off, right? Like right now in America, the idea of being able to literally sell away your rights is, I guess there are some edge cases where this is doable. If you're a soldier, for example, you do lose wow. yeah. some rights, but in a broader sense, I mean, the idea of a democracy is, is kind of like, you don't really get to choose. That's, that's like, that's the fun of it, right? You know, you don't get to choose whether or not you get to choose you live in a democracy that's it uh sorry and i'm fine with that you know uh i'm i'm okay for example with with making it uh it, you shouldn't be able to sell yourself into indentured servitude you know even if you sign a contract cross the t's dot the i's you know the state busts in they're like oh my god you own 50 slaves and the slave owner's like no check it they've got you know signed it all i'm okay with that <coughs> you know, being illegal, not even to speak of the coercive potential of that, but you know, there, <laughs> there are, I'm okay with, with, with those limitations and with regards to the union thing or like economic democracy, it's always like a, you know, well, what works? What do people want? What are people willing to fight for? You know? And I just don't think that works. Maybe workers aren't willing to like unionize to the extent that they used to, you know, maybe they're not pushing as hard as they should. Yeah. I feel like the average American would sell their right to vote for a thousand dollars. I really do. I think, I think the, the 50% or more of Americans, if they could get a thousand dollars from the government to forever waive their right to cast a vote in an election at any level, I think they would do it. I genuinely do think that. Um, What's I, maybe really sad I'm, is I can't, uh, I can't in good faith sit here and yell at you that you're wrong about that. I don't think, I, I don't think saying the majority. Uh, Maybe I'm being hyperbolic with that, but, but a lot of people, like a lot, I, I, a lot of people. Yeah. I, I'd agree that sadly that that may be the case. And, and people do this all the time with their right to privacy too. You know, uh, we do that online, right? We yeah. know social media companies are selling our data to the, to they, the, we know they give it to the NSA because Snowden leaked those documents. What was it? Prism? We, we, we know that. 
We know they sell it to advertisement companies. And I swear to God, I don't know how much of this is me going insane, how much of this is real, how much of this is conspiracy. But in my in my house, I don't have one of those Alexa home things. I have a computer with, with mics. I have I'm talking into one right now. And I will get advertisements for things that I've been talking about. I swear to God, you, I can be in a room with the computer off, you know, and talk about like some incredibly specific piece of equipment and get advertisements for it. Or an Amazon, they'll go this, you would also be interested in, like I buy something on Amazon and it's like cat food. And then the thing you might also be interested in, you know, car snow windshield wiper replacement fluid. Like what the, f like. Well, I, I, I can tell you all about that. Oh, sure. Well, I, please, I can tell you all about that. Please, please do. But I'm just saying like all of this, people aren't great at individually making choices to secure their rights. I kind of think we have to force those rights on them, as silly as it sounds. And economic democracy is one of those things. If we want to force people into their unions, I'm honestly okay with that. Um, I, maybe, maybe people shouldn't get a choice. Maybe you have to sit in the big boy union seat, um, no matter what, right? Maybe that's kind of like the situation we have right now with voting where you can't sell it off or anything anyway please do enlighten me on on this oh sure so your computer you've got it set up with microphone and i assume that for the most part you don't turn that microphone off that is correct and if that computer is on that microphone is listening windows itself is listening now on the surface You'd think, well, you know, Windows is not selling my audio data to Amazon. What the hell is going on? But if you hit just Control Shift Escape right now and bring up your task manager, and you can see all these programs running on your computer. I've got 52 processes of Google Chrome, not 52 tabs, good God, but that's just how it works. Discord, Corsair Service, League of Legends, Steam, Adobe Creative Cloud. Please don't hate me for playing League of Legends. Um, uh, yeah, that's 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 a rough one, but I'll I'll make it through. Deep in here, deep in your task manager, you'll see a lot of services that stem from some game you downloaded, or uh, you know Adobe, for instance. You've got your Adobe running most of the time, and they actually have access. To that microphone data as it comes in and then some of those will have an ai engine in them or they'll just simply ship the data out to a remote server where there is but some of them will have an ai engine in them that will interpret that data and then that company that uh, owns that application has an agreement with amazon for instance where they then transmit that data to them and because it's coming from uh, your adobe account or even your computer, they can just match that straight up to your Amazon account as well. So anything you have that has a microphone and is not off, if your computer is off and there is absolutely nothing else in your room, uh, like not even your cell phone or anything like that, and it's still picking up what you're saying, you've got a ghost, you need to get that exercise. But that aside, if you've got anything on, that, that data is free game. What if it uh, is it, a ghost? Uh, well, there's a few different teams of Ghostbusters. I've heard various reviews about them. Um, uh, apparently, there's there's something about uh, wokeness going on there, but uh, I'm not getting into that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they can help you out there. Yeah, I, I didn't see the movie either. Um, the um, yeah, I don't. The, the details of this escape me. I know. I know broadly why it happens. Um, the right to privacy is, is a lot of this is just really abstracted, right? That's the issue. We, we don't have good brains for this kind of stuff, you know, or maybe we're not educated for it. We're educated to be highly individualistic. Look out for yourself. But unfortunately, you know, we don't live on an island, uh, acting in, in, in a, in a collective fashion can secure individual interests. So for example, our right to privacy, right? You know, our right to privacy to your average person means shit. They do nothing to protect it. Uh, they're not on tour. You know, they're not onioning or whatever. They're not uh, c protecting all their data with VPNs or any of that crap. Um, with democracy, you know, 
people will sell off the right to vote. I'm 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 guessing here, but I really think that would happen. And with unions, you know, yeah. it, it reminds me, the average person's mindset towards unions reminds me, I think it was the Amazon. They had this subway advertisement where they were like, do you know how much union dues can cost? You could go buy a PS3 or something or some crap like that. I mean, it must have been a PS4. It wasn't that long ago. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I think that that sells to a lot of people. Oh, that was Delta, Delta Airlines. That sells to Delta a lot of people. That? I guess so. Multiple people in chat said that, right? Oh right. God. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm only saying like the, one of the reasons why I come down hard on this is because I feel like so many of these rights are we, we're not good at fighting for them individually. Now, I'll tell you which group is really good at coordinating their individual efforts to form a collective action, and that's the bourgeois. Okay, for there aren't many of them, and they are very good at, 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 at levying their, I guess Marx would call it their class interest, right? Class consciousness. They act in their own interests very effectively. Um, they're, they're, they're quite good at that. If you look at the ultra wealthy, there is a massively disproportional set of involvement in a ton of things from political opinions to campaign investitures to, you know, there, there are a ton of metrics that you can track, but they know what they're about. You know, they're educated, they're actualized, they've got free time, they're not bogged down by three part-time jobs or kids they have to take care of with no nanny or partner to help. They are on it. But the average person, I feel like you have to help them along a bit. And in, 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 I, I, you can do that through normalization, which I try to do. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, every once in a while, you know, I fall asleep and I dream that, you know, Huey Long smacks the hammer down and I wake up and uh you know unions are mandatory now fuck you and and uh, you know everyone just uh yeah just wakes up and they're like oh okay you know people bitch about it but give it 10 years and people will, will treat it like it was never any different well i'm just rambling at this you know, point the, i'm very the, sorry no you're you're good the the funny thing is when it comes to local and State level politics, at least those that I've been involved in. The number of people that I've met that are, I, I guess, I, the, the way I'm interpreting your term of bourgeoisie or bourgeois or whatever um, would be in terms of wealth. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Oh, um, I mean, they're almost always wealthy, but I mean, uh, people who make their money through the ownership of uh of of capital so people gotcha. yeah gotcha. people yeah that so they're they don't they don't work for their living like i mean i guess bezos technically like elon musk works right as like the ceo it's a fairly clear but, line yeah. yeah yeah but he doesn't that's not where yeah. he gets his money from so all the people i work with aside from a very very few they're they're all normal working people whether it's Republicans or, or Democrats, uh, you know, it's not until you get to the federal level that the people move in the chains are largely, you know, as you said, bourgeois, that they're not, their own labor is not what makes them their money. Uh, I, I believe you said. Um, so really, for these, these average people to, get influence in the political process, they just gotta they just gotta do it the same way the rest of us did. You gotta give a shit and show up. That's that's most of the people I know, they they don't come from any famous family. They don't come from any wealth. They don't they don't come from people who were involved. I can't say the same about myself, but there's there's a lot of people who did. Uh the president of the political organization that I'm, I'm vice president of uh, grew up in a trailer park and, and, and did like, oh, I don't know what he does now, but he used to work at funeral homes and stuff. Uh, he's not a, he doesn't own anything except maybe his house. And I don't even know if he owns that. Uh, all you got to do to get involved and make a difference and get your voice heard, at least on the local and state level, is to show up honestly show up 
There is another key element, though. I agree with showing up. Political participation is necessary, but there is a key difference. Go ahead. Go ahead. The wealth and political power of the bourgeois allows them to cajole and coerce action out of politicians, but we can't do that without general strikes. You have a CEO of a corporation is like, I'll move to your state if you're willing to subsidize, you know, the construction site of this new, like, corporate plant or whatever. That's, that's a decision with real weight, because they have that, you know, coercive influence. But the only coercive influence working class people have is uh, a general strike, or I guess, you know, um, sector strikes. Uh, but the corporations enforce their will, you know, with that coercive force every hour of every day. It's how they do everything, you know, it's how the entire world works. Everything is built on the back of economic power from corporations. Whereas strikes are vanishingly rare. Also, corporations get to do their power plays without threatening their own livelihoods. But when workers go on strike, you know, they're giving up their jobs. So the, the deck is very much stacked against the working class on this one. Unionizing helps a lot because it helps structure strikes. But beyond that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really unfair dynamic. Um, but the world would grind to a halt if a general strike in America really took hold. So I guess I can hope for that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's not fair. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with you there. It, Whatever, but uh, is that I don't necessarily believe that it not being fair doesn't mean that it can't benefit everyone. That's true. Uh, you know, there is a kind of natural inequality. I would consider, for example, the fact that humans need to eat and drink to be a natural coercive element um, that prevents us from uh, enacting our will. I don't think coercion has to be intentional uh, or, or conscious. Um, but systems can still be improved, you know, uh, it, it, we're never going to have a perfectly fair world. There will always be people with more power and prestige, but I think the, the closer we get to a system where the most powerful person on earth, it lives a life very similar to the least powerful. I think, uh, I, I think things would be altogether quite a bit better. I feel, I feel we're running a bit in circles now. Um, I, which, I was about to. I was about to say the same thing. Uh, cool. I did have just a couple fun things I wanted to touch. Yeah, hit me. Trump and China. All right? Mm -hmm. I think this will rile people up. I think China will win. A little bit more. No, I don't mean Trump versus China. I meant oh. that it's two separate topics. Uh, I'll, I'll just be real brief. Trump. I can't stand the guy. I cannot stand the guy. Yeah, I just thought you'd either. be surprised by that. No, uh, well, I'm, well, I, you come off quite sensible. I'll say I'm not a big fan of the guy myself. I, I, I imagine so, at least. Um, I, 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 post, I posted something a year ago. I, I got reminded of this because it came up on my little Facebook timeline. As you did this a year ago on January 6th, or January 7th, excuse me, because I posted the morning after, mm -hmm. like saying, you know, this is not just impeachable, this is criminal. I hope this guy serves the full length of whatever sentence that is appropriate for, for the crimes that, uh, whatever crimes that they decide he's committed, because that it's an, an unacceptable assault on our democratic system and our what makes what makes America? God, I was about to say great. Uh, <laughs> ah, it's it's getting to us, isn't it? Yeah, for him uh, we use it's not the stick or the carrot. We use the stick on the carrot uh, <laughs> for best results. What I was gonna say, it's the what, what's made America great is our peaceful transfer of power for hundreds of years. I don't care what party you belong to. I don't care what your beliefs are because, you know, you may obviously won't like this, but I agree with many of, of Trump's policies. I don't care what his policies are. If he's assaulting our peaceful transfer of power in this country, I don't think he should be involved in the political process. I think he should be in jail. 
get the hell out of my America. I'm done with done with it. Well, uh, we could we could um, you know give them to China, have them uh, chill in one of those uh, one of those prisons. Yeah, I, I saw some ice cream with John Cena. Yeah, exactly. I saw some some videos of like uh, Chinese political prisoners getting out, and they would like look in a camera and go like, "Thank you to the Chinese government for educating me," or whatever. Oh Lord! I I went on a trip to China less than a decade ago. I'm not going to be any more specific than that um, because I, I I feel like that that could easily dox me. But it was an official trip. It was an official trip. And so we had a government itinerary. And this, this is where my opinion of China flipped from neutral to overwhelmingly negative. Um, the Chinese government took us on a trip. Uh, we went to the capital. We went to Shanghai. We went to some rural areas. They had us go to this one place that they... They were talking about, we're creating, we're uplifting people out of poverty in rural China. And, you know, on the surface, I'm like, you know, that's great. Like, you know, Beijing was, you know, all these big buildings. Shanghai was this, like, corporate mecca. Like, there's all this wealth going on. It looks like they're, you know, using it to help the people out here. We go to this rural village. And you can see these brand new apartment blocks. From the, from the bus, you can see these brand new apartment blocks that have been built. And they look like any old like college apartment kind of style thing. A little balcony on every other one. You know, pretty nice little place. They've got a fountain. They've got a courtyard. Nicely brick-paved walkways. And it's in the middle of this village. And all the surrounding area, you can see the houses that the people uh, had been living in. Uh, just squalor. Uh, forget modern amenities. The, the places were falling apart. They, you know, they, they'd been created before math was created. Uh, I'm being hyperbolic, but we get up and they give us a tour around this new village, and there's nobody in any of these apartments. And so I, someone on our group asks, you know, why is why is nobody inhabiting these? And they said, well, they're not finished yet. Or, or we just finished them, so they haven't moved in. So we're like, okay, whatever. And we start noticing things. Like the pipes along the walls, the exterior walls of the apartment building that are water pipes, don't go into the apartment. The holes where they're supposed to go in, the pipes don't go in there. They just pass right by it. The locks on the doors are fake. There's all these indications that this is not really a apartment complex. This is not something that they're giving to these people. And when we asked the local official, we're like, how's how's they how are these things getting paid for? They said, well, the government's paying for half and the people are paying for half. And I don't know if you know much about the price of real estate in China, but these folks who are essentially subsistence farmers, as we could tell from the village, aren't, aren't going to afford $125,000, basically. And so it became clear that this was just intended as a show for us, that they built this grand structure in the middle of this village, I'm certain displacing whatever was there before, to show off to foreign officials and visitors, not to help the people. And if anything, it hurt the people. It was hu probably humiliating for many of them. And so after that, I, I, I began having a negative view on China. And um, when the Trump administration came around and started engaging with China economically and diplomatically, um, which I think was a motivator behind China's actions in Hong Kong, especially um, to the point that now the entire world sees this bully of a 
government, of a fascist government, honestly, uh, that is the Communist Party of China, uh, I, I think that they are the source of the most evil in this world. Uh, you know, you may disagree and say it's corporations or whatever, but if we're to name any single entity, I would say that the Communist Party of China is is responsible for the most suffering and the biggest obstacle to progress in in raising the quality of life for uh, people of the world. I was ranting. I'm sorry. Uh, no, not at do you all. Have anything on that? <laughs> oh well, to me, it's all different tentacles of the same octopus, right? I mean, the Chinese government has billionaires working directly with it. There's a direct synthesis in the interests of the party of the state because it's not a democracy, and of the corporations under their beck and call. American corporations trade freely with China. We rely on Chinese manufacturing and industry. A ton of plants over there are owned by America, and a ton of stuff over here is owned by them. It's the same monster, capital. And in their case, authoritarianism, more of it than what we have, but I think the problems are pretty similar. Uh, antagonisms brought about by people with different class interests. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fundamentally an extension of the same issues. And as time goes on, more and more of our freedom-loving American corporations are going to kowtow to Chinese interests. We've already seen this with the NBA. We see movies that are being promoted over in China have, like, black people removed from the uh, posters. We see, like, uh, oh, you know, yeah. Chinese-owned mega corporations that, hey, like League, uh, you know, uh, Tencent. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, 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 there are weird restrictions associated with that. And as time goes on, American cultural hegemony starts to wane in favor of China's. We're going to start to enjoy more and more pieces of media that are adjusted for Chinese cultural interests. Probably going to see a lot less skeletons, since that's considered a cultural taboo over there, and they don't include that in their media. They censor it, actually. The government does. Um, so yeah, we, we have that to look forward to. And all of it, in my opinion, at the end of the day, is... Um, a, a lack of democracy, political and economic. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, hopefully whatever problems we could solve here in the States, we could solve there too. All right. Well, uh, Vosh. It, is, it has been a uh, wonderful talk. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for your time and your, your generosity to have me on your channel and, and to allow me to uh, express my views. Uh, I think this was really productive. I, I, I learned stuff. Uh, I, I think you learned some stuff as well, you know, especially that, that property tax discussion. I, I think uh, you, you sounded like you got a lot out of that. Um, I well, hope it reinforces I, the idea that all of us want what's best for the average people of this country and that, as I said, we just have different ways to go about it. I am interested in seeing how the proportion of state income from income tax, property tax, and sales tax would look state to state. I think that'd be a really interesting thing to look into. I also hadn't considered the possibility that increasing the property taxes in a state would actually decrease initial home investment costs. Uh, that's, that's really interesting to think about. I, I, I'd have to look into that. Um, anyway, thank you very much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. We might be doing a bit of a conversation sandwich here because the next one might be as uh, uh, hollow as the first. Uh, <laughs> have a wonderful <laughs> night. Thank you, Vash. You too. Take care. I understand that he should have known this but i hope uh i hope he knew that the first conversation i was referring to was the one with non-compete and not with him that was a good conversation i think it's important to be able to dust up on stuff like that um you know i, I am interested in the the housing taxes kind of thing or republicans should be like him i i will admit that his party alignment is a bit of a mystery to me he has a tremendous amount of faith in the system as is um, but you know, it's, it's fine. It's important to have these conversations.